in the bulletin are sick and I think I heard Joe say this morning that Deborah's going to be having surgery the day after Thanksgiving so let's remember her in our prayers also also the sunshine basket there's a sign up sheet on the bulletin board in the hallway and the brunch and the ornament exchange it's December the 10th and there's a sign up sheet for that also and then the <clears throat> on December the 3rd, the annual shop shopping sheet is on the bulletin board. Uh, and if anyone wants to make a donation to help with that, they can see Susanna. Uh, personal works will be after the evening service, so anyone can stay and help with that would be greatly appreciated. And also, I'll say it again tonight, I hope each one of you have a happy Thanksgiving. Into our worship tonight, our song leader will be Joel Foster, our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by David Mormon, and we'll begin our worship service with open prayer. Will you please bow with me? Our kind of lovely Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have that we can come out and take part of this worship service, be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for your Son, Jesus, as he comes to this earth, lived and died as a man hung up on that cruel cross for the remission of our where we can have a remission of our sins if we do thy will. We also thank you for our health and our strength that you've been able to give to us. At this time, pray that you'll be with all of our numbers that are shut-ins, be with the ones that are sick, be with the ones that be having upcoming surgeries. <clears throat> pray that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that take care of them. I also pray at this time that you'll be all of our leaders of our nation. Pray they'll look unto you for guidance before they make laws and do things that's against thy will. Pray at this time that you'll be with our brother Joel as he leads our singing. Pray each one of, each one of us will lift up our voices and praise unto you. Be with brother Dennis, that he have a rare recollection of things that he studied. Pray each one of us will listen to his lesson, listen intensely. We we'll pray that we'll take and study these things that he teaches unto us, be stronger Christians and teach others thy word. I also pray that we'll be shining examples into our workplaces, our communities, and everywhere we go during the week. <clears throat> Especially pray at this time that you'll be with the church here, be with the church the world over. Pray that each and everything we say and do here always will be according to thy will. Also pray that you'll be with our first responders, 
military, especially the ones on foreign souls, they were their police officers, that you'll protect them, that they may return back to their homes each night. That you'll always be with us, that you'll always guard, guide, direct us, and forgive us all our many sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Me through. 
this morning I don't think was quite done. The legs were still tied. I don't know if it was trying to get away or not. It certainly made me hungry. Exodus chapter 13 verse 17 reads, When Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, although that was near. I'll read a lot more than this, but first I'd like us to notice that it was God that led them. And I think we should all be glad that God leads us. For Romans 8 verse 14 tells us, For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in some of the biggest messes that we can make. We find ourselves in dead alleys, dry places, we wonder sometimes if God knows where he is leading us. Sometimes it seems that we're not going the right way or at least the way we want to go. Maybe it's because we just don't know how to follow. Or maybe we're not doing God's will. Because sometimes we wonder that 
if God is leading us, how come we find ourselves being detoured or running into dead ends, finding ourselves on a deserted road? We'll try to find the answers tonight through God's Word. And we're going to find out that God does lead us, that we are on a journey with Christ as our companion, the Holy Spirit as our guide and our map. In our life's journey, many times things do not turn out as we expect them to. We're going to find that there's going to be a lot of unexpected things along this road of life. But it's not always because we've misread the map. Let's go back to verse 17. We'll read that again along with verse 18. We're going to look at the discipline of detours. And when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was new. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return it to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. God didn't take the short way, the shortcut, the primary trade route, travel route to the land of Canaan is through the land of the Philistines, up along the northern part. It's about a month's journey that way. But God didn't make a mistake. God put them on a divine detour. You know, we always say that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And while it may be the shortest, it may not always be the best. God has a purpose. And many times his detours tells us very quickly and plainly why we are going that way just as he did here. God knew that if he took them through the land of the Philistines, that they would become afraid, especially when it come time to fight. They would turn around. They would want to go back to Egypt. So God's wisdom was to put them on a detour. He knew they weren't ready. And God knew that they would eventually be in battle. That there would soon be wars. And in that very same way, God has called us to a war, but ours is a holy war. As Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, God has a job for us. And he has his blessings upon blessings to give us. And yet, right now, he may have us going around in some kind of a wilderness. Going in circles. You know, how many times have we prayed and prayed for help, and yet we haven't seen it? Could be that God is leading us in a circle because he knows that we're not quite ready for it. And so that wilderness road that we find, sometimes find ourselves on does not mean that God has forsaken us. Just as God has led Israel, he also leads us. And this is the whole point of God leading them on a detour. I'm sure that just like us, they probably did not understand this. They didn't have any idea what God had in store for them. But you know, the same as with us, there is no need to really know. It's just enough that God knows. He knew they weren't ready to meet the challenges they face. 
And we must always remember that God is never in a hurry. When God called Moses, when he went to go get him ready, Moses spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. When God called Paul, Paul was not ready either. Galatians 1 verse 17 tells us that Paul went down to Arabia and spent time there. He didn't go to Jerusalem. He didn't go to the other apostles for training. God sent him there. You know, we think that we have to be achieving and that we have to be going in straight lines or we're not doing God's will. It's not important that we know, but that God knows and that we follow him. In verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 13, I want us to notice something here. For it tells us here that the Lord went before them day by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. We don't have God's cloud and God's pillar of fire. We have God's word today. John 16, verse 13, Jesus, he said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And just as these two pillars were Israel's guide in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit through God's word guides us today. And not just sometimes, but every single moment of this life, we need to walk in the Spirit. Maybe we're going in circles because we haven't followed God's will in our lives. Now, sometimes we find ourselves stumbling around in a wasteland in places where we have no business being. Maybe we tried our very best to follow the will of God, but we still find ourselves going in a circle. Our job as Christians is to keep our eyes on the Lord as a guide. God sees things that we can. He sees if you will, the Philistines we don't see. He sees some weaknesses in us that we don't see and knows things that we don't. So we keep our eyes on him and remember the, the this discipline of divine detours. Israel went through that wilderness for a purpose and so are we. And while God led them on a detour, I want us to look at the dilemma of dead ends. Now there's probably some of us here that can remember when you're driving in an area you're not familiar with and you see a road sign and you take it and it ends up being a dead end. And in those days, there really wasn't a whole lot of place to turn around. You had to back all the way out. Today, we're fortunate in that most places will tell you at the sign if it's a dead end or not. But Israel met a dead end. In the next chapter of Exodus 14 and verses 8 through 12, I'll just give an, a recap of this. It tells us that God had hardened Pharaoh's heart. That Pharaoh had gathered up all his horses and chariots and his army, and he took off after the children of Israel. And he overtook them as they were camped along the Red Sea. When the Israelites seen him coming, they were afraid. Because they had come to, in their eyes, a dead end. They accused Moses of leading them into the wilderness to die. They thought it was better to be enslaved than to die where they were at. 
You're still being led by the Lord. But this time came something more aggravating. And that was the detour. We don't like detours. Detours takes us too far out of our way. Detours takes us oftentimes on unfamiliar roads. Sometimes it takes a while to get back to the intended route. There's nothing more aggravating than taking a detour and hitting a dead end. And that's where Israel was at this point. Boxed in by Pharaoh and his army on one side and the Red Sea on the other. Of course, who do you blame? They blame Moses. But Moses was only doing what he was supposed to do and that was to follow God. They can't see that God led them exactly where he wanted them to be. But this we do see, first two verses of Exodus 14. We find that God is using this moment to let the Egyptians know that he is God. We are going to come into situations that are not just aggravating and frustrating, but we're going to come right up against them anyway. There's no way to stop it. There's going to be a time when we're not going to be able to have a preacher or a brother or sister to tell us a way out. We're not going to be able to find a book that's going to help. We're just going to be there. It's not a discipline. It's a dilemma. It's the dilemma of dead ends. And when we come to that place, this we need to know. There is no panic in heaven. Only plans. There has never been panic in heaven. Ever. God knows exactly what he is doing. But why would God lead them to this place of desperation? Because it would become a place of dependence. In verse 13 of Exodus 14, it says, and the, Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Verse 16, God told Moses what he needed to do. And God brought them to a place of desperation that he might bring them to that place of dependence. The purpose of these dead ends in our lives is to bring us to the place of dependence. And while we might be desperate at times, we need to depend on him. God wants us to one, to fear not. Just as Moses told the people to fear not. And we often find ourselves in a place where there seems to be all kinds of things to fear. But God tells us that we are not to fear anything. 365 times in the Bible, one time for each day of the year, the Bible has said, fear not, or it's equivalent. Hebrews 13, verse 6 says, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. When Moses said, Stand firm. In essence, he's stay, saying it is out of our hands. There is nothing that you can do. Psalms 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Do we stand still? No, not hardly. 
We're too busy manipulating. We're too busy trying and conniving and scheming until we finally hem ourselves in with mountains in front of us, the sea behind us, and the devil coming straight at us. There is no place left to go but up. <clears throat> Be still and know that I am God. We always think we have to do something, even if it's wrong. No. You remember Mark 5, the account of uh, the hogs that Jesus had put the demons in. Verse 13. All of those demons out of one possessed man. They call the man legion. And it tells us that they went into the sea and they drowned. Can you imagine the conversations the hogs have with one another? Look, we're in a mess. But whatever you do, Let's stay together and keep moving. Moses then says, see the salvation of the Lord. For Israel, it didn't mean to stand still and watch what's going to happen. God wasn't going to do anything until the people started moving. And our problem is that we see things that are not as though they should be, or that it might be so. Sometimes in our faith we refuse to hear. We let God handle it. And if he doesn't, then it won't be done. But God is going to give us the strength to deal with. You know, we have folks who are really, really sick. Their prayers have been going on for a long time. And it seems as if nothing <coughs> works. But God is dealing with it. And God is helping them deal with it. God showed them a way out of their dilemma, and it was, and he told Moses to get them moving. And there's no contradiction here in one place where God said stand still and now he says get moving you see through God's salvation he turned the Red Sea into an eight lane highway Oscar C. Eliasson he, he wrote got any rivers you think you can't cross got any mountains you can't tunnel through God specializes in things thought impossible and does things that others cannot do. Verse 22 of Exodus 15. Israel is all across the Dead Sea. Israel has sat there and watched their enemies vanquished. They are just a distant memory. And Moses Verse 22, made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Detours, dead ends, and now a dry hole. Moses is still leading them. They're still not lost. There was no one that misread a map. God was still leading them. If we were in that situation, we might be thinking, look, I need a new map, or I need to upgrade my navigation system, or something is wrong here. Maybe they had the same navigation that Vicki and I had when we tried to get to Hilton Head several years ago. We tried going the right way and it sent us to Charleston. It took us an extra two hours to get where we were going. But you know, these people were still on the road. They haven't done anything wrong. 
they are here by divine providence. They were brought to this point for a purpose. Verse 23 through 25, it tells us that purpose. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses. And they said, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. And there the Lord made for them a statue and a rule. And there he tested them. No. You know, every time they make a new model of a car, and sometimes even another year model of the same car, the auto manufacturers, they put them on a test track. They get them running through different phases of, of drivability. We've seen advertisements on TV, how they test them. They have them going through water and skidding around, going over bumps. They call them test grounds. And when we were in North Dakota, that's where they typically tested their vehicles for cold climates. Now, they certainly didn't test the cooling system because you had to block most of your radiator off in the winter so you get enough heat to get warm in the car. That's what God's people were in right then and there, a testing ground. And God gave them a test, and they failed it. We go through proving grounds every single day. God allows us to go through them. Not so much as to test our faith, but to increase our faith and our reliance on Him. When things don't go our way, what do we typically do? We complain. We murmur. When the things were not as the children of Israel wanted, they complained. They murmured. Paul warns us in Philippians 2 verse 14 to do all things without murmurings or grumbling. And that murmuring isn't a little sin. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 7 through 10, he lists murmuring alongside with idolatry and fornication. We're going to come to a dry hole in our lives. Sooner or later, we're going to be there. And what will our response be? What will we do? Will we murmur or will we pray? Those who find the sweet water out of bitter water are those who know how to pray and have faith. All the time that the people are murmuring, you know what was in front of them the whole time? That tree. And that tree, it speaks of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's what Jeremiah called the righteous branch in Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. Even in the most barren and bitter places in our lives, we need to realize that our faith in God is enough. We're going to be making the detours. We're going to, at times, seem to be at a dead end. And yes, we're going to hit a dry hole. But God's still there. God has not left us to fend for ourselves. We need to fear not. We need to stand still. We need to see that the salvation of the Lord will show us the way. If there is anyone here this evening... <coughs> desires tonight to obey the gospel. We want to give you that opportunity tonight. Your faith leads you to repent this hour and to confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Son of God, to be baptized for the remission of sins. You can be added to God's church.
you will be able to begin a life without fear. You will have someone that will guide you down this road in life. And if you are a child of God, if you balled up the map and are going it on your own and you realize that you need to get back on the route that God has selected for you, we want to give you that opportunity tonight as together we stand in the sun. Hear the sweet voice, and let the word depart. And close thine eyes against the light. For sinner, harden not thy heart. Be saved, O tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Well, We gather around this memorial feast, a time we set aside all the worldly things in this life and focus on a true blessing in life, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. And to use this feast as a memorial for that sacrifice. The bread that represents his body. The fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed on that cross for the remission of our sins. This time, will you bow with me as we ask God's blessing on the bread. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time that we can gather around this table to remember the sacrifice of your son of the tremendous love that you have for each and every one of us in sending him to die in our stead. And we ask now your blessings on this bread. And as we take of it, may we always remember just exactly what it cost to gain our freedom and to release us from the sting of death. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. continue in prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that you will ask your blessings on this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed, the blood that, that washed away the sins of the world, the blood that continues to cleanse a repenting heart. And we pray, Lord, that as we partake of this, that we don't let this blood be shed in vain, but that we do our very best to honor it and to uphold what it stands for. We thank you so much for your son. And we thank you so much 
for the sacrifice that you went through in sending him here to endure all that he endured for our sakes. In Jesus' name we pray. Ask that we left on the table for those who do not have the opportunity to give today. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings in this life. And we know, Lord, that uh, at times it seems like we have nothing, but we are among the richest in the world because we have you and your son. And we thank you, Lord, for entrusting in your care all that we possess. We pray now, Lord, that you allow us to give back a portion of what you've allowed us to take care of, that we may further the work of your kingdom here on this earth, in this community, and around the world, and that you continue, Lord, in these blessings that you bestow on us each and every day. And we thank you and ask your forgiveness that you accept our gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Personal works right after services. If anybody can stay to help, it would be deeply appreciated. This time, we stand, we'll be dismissed with prayer. Let's pray. Man, Father, let's also this message tonight. Give it to us. Everybody, every night, this morning, give it to us. Every word. Just like a while through our lives, I just suppose. You add to, help us write, which is the gospel. Let's honor to be the Lord. Also, it's to your name, King of the Hicks, the Doubt, Joel Ladd, give to us a real word. Uh, this is Nikki, your two some more. Now, that's that today and tonight. Just, just a word of God, give to us a real word. Uh, those that are here, uh, hospitals, or all the family members, and all of them all get well. Uh, missionaries, or oh, well, maybe. Hang across the cavalry. Come on, wait at our table. Good morning, feast. Give them to us. The real word. Now, that's nice what we're having today. Pass the sign. Very nice. Hey, we're having. Give them to us. It's by your own. Through our lives, which is ours. The part of this place, live here tonight. Singing, uh, uh, good for me and Terry. Christmas Minders. There are trials each day. Hold it, hold it be heaven. There are a million blessings to give to us. Stay upon us. Uh, get back as one portion. There are blessings as well. Give them to us. It's a real word. Uh, 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 this is where my name is Shane. Hope it gets better. I'm saying very much. Let's stay up here. Did this, did this auditorium give to us? Do it in a word. Where's uh, my aunt? His husband. Where's the woman family? Uh, very much. Of this place and fault and sins. She's got God's word. Read the Bible every day. Look at, look at James. I heard that today. Give it to us. Read the word. That's how the weekend. Give it to us. There's our traveling this week. Oh, oh, uh, holiday weekend, give them to us. Well, my sisters come this weekend. They're coming uh, this week. They want my sister boy. She just prayers with my church mom. I love this place. 
and she errors. Yeah, I busy it all. Then she work. Then it was very long. What is what this feeling? If you did not. I was facing in there and hit other songs on Pink Cow. Inside the church, outside the church, we go along, just others. We do this way. Talk about Moses. He is a man. Give it to us. The real word. I bought this place, they fit or not. I set my ways. That was Jesus and any cross through our lives. Oh, they would have all things, Father, all the way we're done. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.